senior researcher at the University of Porto. Her PhD was in ethology from the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. She's an expert in laboratory animal welfare and has a wide interest in the ethics of animal research and technology, behavior, and welfare of laboratory and farm animals. So today, Anna is going to talk about understanding neonatal mortality in laboratory mice. So the floor is yours, Anna, whenever you are ready. Thank you uh, for the kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to be speaking tonight. I'm speaking let me see where, okay. I'm speaking on behalf of a, gr a great team that is behind this, this project. Uh, and I would like to thank the key people who have been involved in this. In my own institution, Sophie Brajon, who is now in, in Quebec, Gabriela Morello, and Sara Capaspeneda, who are still working with me. And our collaborators at Webram Institute, Colin Gilbert, and at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, most recently Jan Hultgen and Ellen Weber. And uh, for some of the research I'll report from, uh, from earlier, an earlier period of this research, also Boo Algus. And uh, grateful for the funding and also for all the animal facility personnel within the I3S, the Babram Institute, and the Welcome Sanger Institute. They have all been uh, instrumental and played a key role for the, the studies that you will be learning more about in, in this presentation. So, being born is dangerous. This is why uh, for humans in most parts of the, uh, the world it is considered preferable to be born in a hospital where you have, uh, you have the support capacity if something goes wrong. This is why um, sheep farmers lose lots of sleep during lambing seasons to be able to uh, follow what is happening and give support to um, youth with problems and why horse breeders would be willing to invest in an apparatus that could be placed on the back of the mare and presumably give you a signal that she's about to, to give birth. This is all because we realize that this is a critical situation uh, for an animal to go through and being born or being newborn is perhaps especially dangerous and this is uh, i'm speculating here but there are there are reasons to to think that it's perhaps especially dangerous in polytoxous animals so animals that give birth to a large litter uh, because possibly not all uh, all um, offspring within that litter will be in an equally fit status uh, we know for uh, pigs, which is the farm animal, the farm mammal, which the main polytoxus farm animal, farm mammal, uh, we know that early piglet mortality is somewhere between 5 and 35 percent. I've taken that figure from an um, extend from extension information from the uh, FAWEC in Barcelona. If I were to produce a similar kind of extension information for mouse pups, I would say that early mouse pup mortality is between 15 and, and 50 uh, percent. Uh, interestingly, early mortality is much more studied in pigs than it is in mice. These the the figures you see on the bottom of the, I could probably point, yeah. So these figures are the output of a PubMed search that I did in October last year. And you see there are nearly 500 hits for piglets and mortality, whereas there, there are just uh, around 120 for mice and mortality. Um, so we know more about mortality in farm animals and uh, the best source of information uh, on this in terms of animal welfare is still uh, this uh, now more than 15 year old review paper by, by Meller and Stafford on animal welfare implications of neonatal mortality and morbidity in farm animals. Uh, sure, there has been much more experimental and much more empiric work after that, but this review paper is, is still um, the, the main review coverage of this. And what they point out is a hypothermia due to heat loss and or insufficient heat production, meaning an animal that doesn't get 
get going the way it's supposed to do after uh, being born. So it doesn't breathe as well as it should. It, it, it doesn't get uh, food, it doesn't get milk the way that uh, would be compatible with uh, so fitness and survival. And uh, also associated with maternal underfeeding, mismothering, infection and injury. Um, what we knew when we started to study uh, neonatal mortality, which was roughly around the same time as, as uh, Meller and Stafford published their paper, uh, we knew that uh, mortality, neonatal mortality was high in laboratory mouse breeding, that it would, that it was higher than would, that would be acceptable for farm animals under comparable conditions. Uh, and definitely higher than what would be expected given the protection that we give to lab animals against environmental challenges. So uh, the, the environment uh, in which piglets are born with these mortality rates between 5 and 35 percent that I, I referred to, uh, that is also a wide variety of environments which are much less clean, um, much higher variation in temperature, uh, in in uh, overall housing conditions, etc. Whereas we have, we keep laboratory mice under highly standardized conditions with controlled temperature and and no or as far as possible no microbial no no patho no um, pathogens available. Um, so overall, there is there is a problem here that is bigger than we would expect it to be, and that is fairly uh, unknown. Um, I came to this from a background in farm animals, so uh, naturally I didn't have the, the theoretical, well, I didn't have the, 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 at that point the knowledge about the, the field. I turned to the, the obvious person to, to ask, uh, the obvious person that people in, in the biomedical research institution turn to to get to know about their mice would be vet, the vet of the, the animal facility. So talking to vets of animal facilities, we were told the neonatal mortality was especially problematic in C57 black 6 mice and in genetically altered mice. And I'm going to take a, make a detour here to, talk, to introduce you to the C57 black 6 mouse, uh, because I reckon that probably some of you uh, are, may not be all that familiar with laboratory mice. So this is the C57 black 6 J mouse. This is a, a, a strain, which is the, the term that we use in lab animals for what in, in other animals is called a breed. Uh, and the J here stands for the substrain from the Jackson laboratory. So there are more C57 black 6 mice than 6J mice. Uh, but that's really a detail that's not that, that important. This is what they look like. They are quite beautiful with their black shiny coat if they're in, in, in good shape. Um, they are the my, most widely used inbred strain and they are the preferred strain for genetic alterations. Um, inbred mice means that there has been at least 20 generations of full sib, full sibling or parent offspring matings. That uh, 20 generations of these matings brings you to an inbreeding coefficient of 98.6. The reason for doing this is to achieve genetic standardization. The idea is that my research subjects should be as identical as possible to A, my research subjects five years ago, and B, the research subjects of a colleague working on, on another continent. Uh, the, the, the importance of inbreeding has been challenged quite recently, and this is just for your information. This is a 2018 paper that actually found that uh, the coefficient of variation was just as big for a number of parameters, both behavior and non-behavioral, as uh, for inbred as it was for, for outbred mice. But this is the, the received wisdom in the field is still that is preferred to, to work with, genetic, with uh, genetically standardized, so inbred mice. Because we're going to talk about uh, reproductive characteristics, I also want to touch very briefly on the question of inbreeding depression. Uh, as I'm sure a number of you know already, inbreeding depression is a decline in fitness, in reproductive performance associated with an increase in the inbreeding uh, coefficient in a population. 
This happens because deleterious recessive genes start to appear more frequently in homozygosity where they actually give, uh, where they start to, to bring about pathologies or bring about uh, phenotypes with, with reduced vigor, with reduced health. This is classic uh, breeding theory point. Uh, what is specific uh, for the inbred strains uh, or what is important when looking at inbred mouse strains is that uh, as the population is kept in inbreeding over a long time, natural selection will act on it. And some of these genes, the deleterious recessive genes will actually be gradually removed because the animals that carry these genes in homozygosity uh, will not be performing well, they will not be breeding well. Uh, and we have a long history of inbreeding mice. The C57 black six strain uh, was established uh, in the early 1920s. So presumably there has been a lot of cleaning this strain of the bad, uh, bad quote unquote uh, genes. So it is, uh, it does make sense, biologically speaking, to look at uh, mortality, early mortality, reproductive problems as a, a a problem that one can address also from a biological perspective. So coming back to what we were told by, by facility veterinarians uh, was also that neonatal mortality was associated with maternal stress and subsequent infanticide. This is a classic thing to, to, to say, okay, the, the mothers get stressed and they kill their, their litter. Uh, and that it was affected by maternal experience as this happens more often in uh, in mothers, uh, in females that give birth to their, their first lecture, so with no previous experience. So this is the, uh, this is the standard perception of the problem uh, by people who actually work with it, with the, the animals, so the equivalent to farmers, if you, if you are from, if you work in a farm animal context. Um, we have not challenged the, 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 the issue of this being especially problematic in C57 black six. We have focused only on this strain uh, to a great extent or because it's the most important strain uh, and if the problem is perceived to be big in this strain uh, it makes sense to address it. Whether the other two points are actually true is something that I'm going to spend the first um, part of this presentation or the, the, the subsequent let's say third of the presentation to, to talk about. So let's have a look at uh, the data that addresses these these questions. Does reducing maternal stress improve pup survival? Um, lots of the studies that give support for this uh, belief are, are studies that, that show positive e effects of environmental enrichment. And here are just two examples. There are more, but these are two relatively recent or, or, or import, and or important studies. Uh, Brianna Gaskill and colleagues found that providing nesting material increased breeding index. So the number of pups weaned per dam per week and it also increased pup weaning weight. And Leidinger and, and collaborators found that lack of enrichment resulted in greater pre-weaning pup mortality, reduced weight and delayed development. We had actually studied the effect of uh, enrichment already before these two studies were published, but it, we, we had not published our results uh, because they were not uh, all that clear and, and uh, to us. So we've looked at um, fastest barren and furnished cages. So here we used a, a big extreme. Uh, we then were thinking about uh, there was an unrealistic extreme and we moved on to a study where we uh, used just smaller variations on the, the, the housing. So we had, a house, we had the same cage size, we had a small amount of nesting material because it wouldn't be good practice for uh, mouse husbandry not to give nesting material. And then we had an equal size cage with more uh, environmental enrichment in it. Uh, and here we also had two um, knockout genotypes, which were still healthy animals. And when we looked at the reproduction results, uh, they were not uh, all that clear and we were not 
uh, thrilled by the, the outcome of the different housing systems as a way of potentially controlling uh, or preventing uh, pop mortality. So we ended up uh, not actually addressing the question of housing, but instead pooling the data from all these studies to address questions of behavior. Uh, and I will get back to, to these, uh, actually, no, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you right now about the first study here and I'll come back to the later uh, a bit further on in the presentation. Um, so conveniently, we used questions as the title of the papers, and I'm going to stay with these questions. Uh, pop mortality in laboratory mice, is that a question of infanticide or not? So to determine if adult animals were actively killing pups, Elin Weber, uh, in her PhD, devised this decision scheme with the aim to narrow in on the time window between when a pup is last seen moving and when it's seen still and never moving again. So that's the closest that we can get to defining what is being dead uh, only simply from the, the observation of uh, a video. And uh, I'm not going to talk you through this decision scheme in, in detail, uh, but you can find it in the paper. Um, that was published in Acta Veterinaria Scandinavica in 2013, and I'll give you the, the, the link in the presentation. Um, the data we had was for 10 females that were losing their litter. We did not have great video recordings of this, so these were re video recordings from with our first video recording equipment, which was used with a, a sequencer, so you have 30 seconds for each video camera, and you have, and it was only black and white. Uh, we could only do full behavior analysis of five of these females, so this is really a small uh, sample set. Um, we could find females eating dead offspring, and we could females interacting with both moving and dead offspring, but we could not find a single instance of a female where the transition of a pup being move from moving to not moving anymore uh, involved the female manipulating the pup in a way that she could have killed it. So basically we found no female killing a pup, but that again, that was of five females. It was more pups, but it was five females, five litters. Uh, we are following up on this in an ongoing study with a larger data set. We had 55 litters and a much better video equipment. So here we have continuous recordings and we have, uh, uh, we have color recordings for the daylight videos, which obviously makes it much easier to, to see if a pup is dead or alive, given that these pups have no fur. So they are pink if they, they, they are alive. And if they are dead, and especially if they've been dead for some time, they will actually be grayish. Uh, with this much larger data set, we find that there is some infanticide, but it's still, it's a very rare phenomenon. Uh, so basically, uh, no, the answer to the, this question is no, it's not associated with maternal stress or infanticide. Uh, environmental enrichment seems to have a positive effect, but this may also be due to thermoregulation because this um, environmental enrichment always involves giving nesting material or more nesting material. Uh, infanticide happens, but it's not a major cause of mortality. Um, what is major is the confusion uh, between cannibalism and infanticide, and I'm therefore going to spend a couple of slides on that. So uh, cannibalism does not equal infanticide. Cannibalism means to eat an individual of the same species. Infanticide means to kill an infant. And as an example of how this is not well defined in otherwise well-designed studies. I'm going to, I'm using two 2015 studies. Um, Schmidt et al said, we recorded infanticide if we found remains of dead pups or if pups disappear without any trace. There is nothing in this definition that allows you to say that these pups were actually killed. Uh, Garner et al defined infanticide as, the, the, as litters born and disappearing finding dead pups, 
finding parts of pups or observing animals killing pups. In this, the only part that allows you to say this is infanticide is the last, uh, the last part here, observing animals killing pups. Uh, in this study, there was very little mortality, so not having a good definition is not, was, was not detrimental for the outcome. In this study, uh, it was because there was a lot of mortality. And the, the authors saw infanticide, I think, twice or three times, and they assumed that all the rest, uh, they saw killing three times, and they assumed that all the rest was infanticide. And I interpret that in terms of the females controlling uh, reproduction by killing pups. So that here it has a massive uh, implications for the uh, interpretation. So attributing pup death to the wrong proximate cause has consequences for the interpretation. Uh, removing dead pups to keep the nest clean is an adaptive behavior. Infanticide is only adaptive in a few specific situations, uh, typically when the offspring is not yours. Uh, but also perhaps in some extreme situations where it's unlikely that the infant, infant will survive. Uh, so you should perhaps not continue to invest in it. So no, uh, it's not probably not about maternal stress. Uh, it's, it's definitely not about infanticide to a great extent. So is neonatal mortality affected by maternal experience? Uh, there is some experimental support for this. Brown and collaborators found that pup survival was higher in second litters and in first litters uh, in an experimental study. When we looked at this uh, in a retrospective analysis of 344 parturitions, we did not find the parity effect. When we looked uh, at retrospectively at 10,000 parturitions, we found, we found an age effect, an effect of the, the maternal age, but that was, there was reduced pup survival in higher parities, which uh, is also uh, obviously associated with older mothers. Uh, so several studies show bigger litters, more pups wean to multiparous than to primiparous females, but that does not seem to be because mortality is greater in litters. Uh, that this does not seem to be because mortality is greater in litters to primiparous females. And there is an obviously confound, or there are obviously two confounds here. Uh, one is the age effect if you have older mothers, and another is um, uh, the effect uh, of that the, the, the litter size, which may very well be smaller in first time mothers because they are physiologically usually less mature and they are smaller, uh, they may be smaller females even. So the remaining questions from our uh, previous studies, do laboratory mouse females that lose their litter behave differently around parturition? And the answer is yes. Here are uh, six different behaviors where there was a significant difference. Uh, you've got the proportion of observations on the y-axis. You've got hours in relation to parturition on the x-axis. So you have zero, that's where uh, parturition happened and so you have a period before and you have a period after and um, the um, dotted line the broken line these are females that lost their litter and the, uh, the solid lines are females that uh, brought their successfully brought up their litter to, to weaning and you can see that there was more nest building in uh, the females that had surviving Litters and there was more passive maternal behavior. In females losing their litter, there was more parturition related behavior, there was more ignoring still pups. This is obviously only after parturition because uh, before there are no pups. And there was also more time spent outside the nest. So there is something happening here which is, which is different. If we link this to the question of um, the effect of experience. For this study, we only looked at uh, the, the, the first parturition. We didn't look at any, any uh, further parturitions in these animals. So we don't know if this is a difference between individuals or it's a difference between parturitions. Um, could be. 
that lots of uh, the pup loss here is associated with difficult parturitions that may not be an individual characteristic, but uh, something happening uh, at that specific litter, that specific parturition. So again, um, no clear cut results for the effect of maternal experience, especially not in the way that uh, was, is the common belief that this is a problem of fast time uh, mothers. Uh, okay, I've spoken for 25 minutes. So if, are there any questions at this point? I'm happy to take them. Yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, please yeah, type in to the chat box. And uh, actually I have one more kind of simplistic or basic question. I'm wondering because at the beginning you mentioned that the, yes, the, the neonatal mortality seems to be really high. And mm -hmm. then you made analogy to, you know, farm animals like pigs. So I'm, I'm just curious, why, why is it, why is this problem not being, you know, uh, focused on either by the, the laboratory uh, laboratory science uh, fields or even by the the welfare fields let's say i mean yeah compared to the farm animal is it because the economic is different um yeah this is a really really interesting question um it, it took a long time for us to uh, to be successful in getting the message across that this was a was really a problem uh, I think we've made a breakthrough through very recently because we've had we had an invitation last year to uh, an RSPCA um, uh, event uh, in their work on um, uh, ending severe experiment or severe suffering in, in lab animals and I had a specific event on mortality and, and they, they realized that this was a real problem. Um, why is this not less more more studied? I think this, uh, if my speculation is that this has to do with who is dealing uh, with with this. So people who keep lab animals uh, are of researchers who keep lab lab animals are usually not uh, experts on animal biology. They would usually, as, as I did, turn to the vet for uh, an idea of what is happening. The vet has, on the one hand, uh, a perception which we have realized is probably uh, is, is not particularly correct. Uh, another problem, and we can come, we'll come back to that later, is that this, uh, a lot of this problem is invisible because, uh, you know, I, I guess if you don't, if you if you're really not careful about monitoring a sow uh, and if she would actually eat a piglet you could eventually have a, a a sow having giving birth to 12 piglets and you'll only have 10 when you get there and you didn't realize there were 12 but Piglets are generally visible. If, if, they are, if they are under the sow, it's because she is basically she's going to crash them. Um, mice uh, and and I mean when you when we speak uh, cows or, or or mares or ewes, basically you it doesn't it, it's just unheard of that that uh, uh, a young is born and then lost before you have seen it. Whereas this is not at all uncommon uncommon in lab mice because they are very small uh, and they are born in a nest. And there is this additional myth, which is you should not check on the peri parturient female because then she will be stressed and then she will kill the offspring. So a lot of this mortality is actually not even known by the facility manager. Thanks, thanks. Yes, that's a really interesting point. And so we have one question from uh, Birte, and then uh, she said, uh, acknowledging that mice are not just small rats, do you know if pup mortality is also a big problem in rats? Uh, I don't know, because I have this, I, I, my impression is that it's a smaller problem. Uh, that is a huge problem in mice, and it's not a huge problem in, in, in rats. Uh, but I have, I will here admit my uh, absolute tunnel vision in, in, in this, in that I have only worked with C57 
black six mice and already that is is uh, is a lot so uh, i'm not an expert on, on that so okay we have another one from christina and yeah, she thanks you for a very interesting talk. Do you think that high neonatal mortality might affect the surviving pups? That is, is mortality of siblings an early life experience that might extend to adult life? Uh, I have no idea. It's an interesting question. Uh, uh, and I don't know. It, but it's it's something that would be worthwhile uh, looking into absolutely so perhaps at this point i should say that the talk is, is not finished so um i i suggest that we, i go, go on and uh, we take the remaining questions in in the end yes please please do thanks so um, what I've talked on, uh, about so far is a bit of a backlog of, uh, uh, of research, and that's primarily in Alien Weber's PhD work. Uh, in the project that we've just concluded, um, the, the, our starting point was we were really interested in understanding, uh, in looking at the question of communal nesting. So house mice under semi-natural conditions often nest and nurse communally. That means that uh, at least two females, uh, possibly more, depending on the, 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 the setup where they, they are kept, they will have their litter in the same nest. This also happens in laboratory animals, and you can see this on, on uh, these magnificent photos by, by Joe Garner and colleagues, uh, where they had this bright idea of keeping mice of the same strain but with different coat colors together. So you can see here that. Uh, this is obviously a, a, an albino female, but she is nursing black offspring and she's nursing uh, possibly albino offspring. So you, it's very, and here you see a mix of these two, uh, two litters in the same nest. So this was a very obvious and very, very illustrative uh, evidence that there is communal nursing also in, in laboratory mice. Um, this is thought to bring advantages uh, having to do with the parent the shared parental care and the access to uh, nursing milk from more than, than one, one mother. In the breeding systems that we use in lab mice breeding, trios offer an opportunity for com communal nursing, so we were interested in finding out if this affects survival. We expected that it would be good for survival because, well, if, if communal nursing wouldn't be good, it wouldn't be uh, a behavioral strategy that would uh, be preserved by, by evolution. Uh, so we were very surprised to find, uh, when we started to look at our results, they were not at all in line what, uh, with what we expected. So here we got 54 females in single housing and 55 females in, in trio housing. Trio means two females and a male and uh, a substantial uh, uh, something that I would have done different today is we should have had a male in the, for the single females as well, but we didn't. We had just separated the females. Um, so here you see the, the, the single housing and the trio. Uh, here you have percentage of litter loss, so that's the entire litter disappearing or dying rather, not necessarily disappearing. And here you have uh, uh, mortality on, the level, on the, the level of individual pups. And you see basically the, the numbers are basically the, the same. But something very interesting happened if you look at the third condition here, which was actually not a condition that we planned, but was something we realized. So this is completely this is serendipitous in, in this sense. But we, re we realize that what is happening when you have two females is uh, sometimes you have another litter in the cage when a litter, the litter that we are studying is born, sometimes you don't. So the trio plus here represents a situation where there was an older litter in the cage already when the new litter was born. And that is where you see this is really, really detrimental for the for the younger litter, you have about 50% of the litters, the, the, the newborn litters 
die, are lost in this situation, and you have a mortality on the level of individual pups, which is somewhere just over 70%. So this is really, this is something that you would really not want if you are uh, at all responsible for, for breeding mice. Uh, we were uh, we were uh, shocked. We were really we we were perplexed to find this these results, and so were uh, the facility where we we studied this. Uh, but this this is an experimental study. It's a fairly large one, but it's an experimental study. And I want you uh, want to bring uh, the question of experimental studies versus big data. Um, into discussion. I know this for those of you who work with farm animals, this is not, uh, this is already not a new thing. It is much more, still much more a new thing in lab animals, again, for somewhat surprising re reasons. Uh, obviously, there are advantages with experimental studies. So you get greater control, you can collect more fine grained data. The disadvantage is you have much smaller number of animals. Uh, the, the studies that I've reported so far, they, are, they range from 20 to 110 females. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very small numbers compared to what you can get from the breeding management software data that you can get out of any, uh, any breeding facility in, uh, in a biomedical research institute today. Basically, they have a software for, for uh, keeping track of the animals. What people don't do is use that uh, data for uh, to find out much about their 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 animals. Partly because that's a large, that's a huge amount of, of work. Uh, and it's my uh, privilege to to be working with uh, a welfare researcher and uh, statistic uh, stats enthusiast and big data enthusiast, Gabriela Morello. And the results I'll, I'll present to you now are completely thanks to Gabriela Skills and her uh, great enthusiasm to work with big data. Uh, so we've got data set from Babram Institute and Welcome Sangri Institute. These are two big mouse breeding facilities in the UK. And we started off by 10,000 litters from one of them and 32,000 from, uh, from the other facility. Uh, the data had to be cleaned. This is a huge amount of work uh, that Gabriela, with the help of Sara Capas, uh, worked out over a number of months. And we ended up with 9,000 uh, litres from one of the, the collaborators and 25,000 from the, the other. Uh, and we uh, divided this into two data sets, a full data set uh, with all the litters and then another data set with the overlapped litters. Uh, because to follow up on this problem here with, with litter overlap. Uh, and this, this work has just been accepted for publication in PLOS One, so it will be published in, in, in August, um, I think the 12th of, of August. What did we find? What did we find? Uh, the first finding, which is, is really important here, is the overall mortality. It's 14% in one of the facilities, it's 39 in the other. Uh, that is widely different in two facilities, which are all very good facilities with very competent personnel, a high health status, good management, etc. And you see 39% uh, is more than double the, uh, the, the proportion of 14%, so great variation. And none of these match the reference data from Jack's mice, so the main uh, supplier of these mice, uh, because that's eight. Uh, the other finding is it confirms what we found in the experimental study that pup overlap is a risky thing, but it's a risky thing uh, we figured out only in a given situation, which is when there is a large age difference. So if the age difference is um, uh, is small, here it's uh, less than eight, day, eight days of age, then it's not a risk. That there is already a, a litter in the cage does not reduce your chance of survival. But if the other pups are much older, then it's a problem. If they're no longer there, 
then obviously it's not a problem that you don't have overlap. Uh, when are pups safe? Um, here we looked at uh, the here this illustrates the increasing number of pups in a litter. If the litter is very small, uh, the risk for mortality is, is large. If it's uh, um, medium size and up to 10 pups, mortality is low. If uh, the litter size is very large, 14, 15 is, is, or is very large for this strain, then mortality is, is high again. If the number of older siblings, and siblings here is, uh, means the other litter in the cage, if that increases, uh, mortality increases. If their age increases, mortality increases. And if the, the, the age of the other litter, if the age of the mother increases, uh, mortality again increases. And these are data from around 30,000 pups. So these are data that which are very robust in comparison to uh, all the experimental studies that we've, we've referred to. Uh, and I've been speaking for 40 minutes already, so I will wrap this up uh, quickly with uh, some very still quite preliminary data. Uh, from what do pups die? And here is the, the privilege of working with a vet who is interested in lab mice and who is interested in pathology and who is enthusiastic about dissecting dead pups. So, uh, Great thanks to Sara Capas-Peneda, who has been producing and is continuing to produce this data for, for us. Uh, what we found, what the preliminary findings of looking at whether the lungs of dead pups float or not, and whether the dead pups had milk in their stomach, uh, we find that a great proportion, about half of the mice, the dead pups that were found, um, the, the lungs did not float, so these mice have possibly never started breathing. Uh, and of those that had evidence of, of breathing, only 7% had milk in their stomach. So of those that were clearly not stillborn, uh, only a very small proportion actually got to get a decent first meal uh, of, of milk. Uh, which is really interesting because it brings us back to the main risk causes of neonatal mort mortality in farm animals. They may actually be important also in laboratory, laboratory mice. Uh, because you see here, hypoxia, not breathing properly, starvation, not getting enough milk. We clearly see this happening also in, uh, in our lab mice. So, to wrap this up, what are the consequences for animal welfare? Paradoxically, there is probably not much pup suffering. Stillborn pups are unlikely to have gained consciousness, so there's probably no suffering at all. Gradually increasing hypothermia is generally associated with a loss of consciousness. Uh, those of you who have experience of being in cold climate and having learned of the risk of freezing to death have possibly also learned that this is uh, generally not something that is as unpleasant as it should be to, uh, to drive you away from being very cold. Uh, where the suffering is, it's probably for the, for the mother. It's a threat to maternal health and, and well-being because the, the litter loss will uh, lead to, well, not an increased fre frequency necessarily, but at least an increased number of uh, pregnancies and parturition, so a heavier load on the, on the female. What are the consequences for animal numbers? Based on an estimated neonatal mortality rate of 30% uh, in lab animals, and the EU statistics for 2011, uh, means we would have to breed another two to three million extra mice per year to compensate for those who die before weaning. So here is the really huge impact. What can we do to prevent mortality? Based on what we know so, so far, these are the, this is, these are the evidence-based recommendation, pre nesting material, prevent avoidable causes of hypothermia, and avoid keeping females breeding into advanced ages. 
But possibly the most important thing here, uh, I know everyone says we need to do more research, but here we really need more information. We, we, we've shown that when you look at actual breeding uh, practical uh, um, facility conditions, you have much larger mortality than in reference data. So we actually don't know. We don't even know how large the problem is. We know very little about the mechanisms and the, the, the factors. So we really need more work here. Uh, more reliable data from more strains, and more uh, animal facilities. Uh, and here uh, is reading for what is already published. Uh, we've got a project website where we uh, will be updating with new material as it becomes published. Here's my email address for contacts. And if you're specifically interested in uh, post-mortem analysis in neonatal mice on the 20th of August, you have an opportunity in the Karolinska Institute webinar series to listen to Sara Kapaspanela talking about this. Thank you very much for your patience in uh, listening to, for, to this issue for three quarters of an hour. Happy to take your questions. Thanks, Anna. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, topic. And then, yeah, definitely needs more attention. And we, I think we, we earlier on, we had a question from Irene, but I think uh, the, uh, you answered that along your talk. She was asking about the age difference between the litters, uh, uh, the overlap in the communal nesting. Actually, the second question, I think is still quite interesting. Can it be that the older, so you can hypothesize that the, the older, a litter also kills and uh, competes between the females? Uh, what, we, what we have looked at here is uh, if, there is a, if there is more trampling or if there is, is evidence of, of infanticide, and we haven't found that. Um, what we haven't looked at because we haven't um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's visible from the, or well, I am sure it's not visible for the, from the video recordings we have at present. This is a huge challenge to work with mice compared to with pigs is, is the possibility to see them. Uh, so what we, we weren't able to see in the, the video material that we have is if the larger pups replace the younger pups uh, in terms of access to milk. We think that may be the case. And uh, in future studies, we need to develop a, a more sophisticated video setup with more cameras and more angles so that we can capture more of the nursing and be able to, to, to evaluate this. Thanks. And Catalina asks, uh, how are mice usually housed in laboratories, in groups, pairs, or individually? Uh, so the most common uh, breeding systems is either one female and a male or two females and a male so we call that pair breeding and trio breeding and um i know that i know since we've started to speak about this or we, since we started to present these most recent results in in the lab animal community we know that some that a few facilities this is rare but a few facilities have perceived that that trio breeding is not good uh, so they moved to 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 pair breeding, uh, but um, if you look at the overall productivity per cage, you have uh, and that is usually the the measurement unit, and that's the unit on on which you you base costs in an animal facility is the cage. It's not the number of animals that are in the cage, but it's the number of cages you have. And even if you have much greater mortality in in trio cages. Uh, you still have a few more pups coming out per cage. So in terms of costs, it's still, uh, it's still cost effective to, uh, to use trio breeding and not use pair breeding. Thanks. Um, and Birte is asking, how dangerous is the male? Is there a bruise effect? Uh, the male is not dangerous here because he's always there. So it's always his offspring, and he is actually plays a role in taking care of them. Yeah. 
we we also have many thanks from the audience. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Actually, I, I was thinking that so you 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 also so now you're using the big data, but then as you mentioned that earlier, there is the invisibility issue. So do you mm -hmm. think that the big data can still kind of underestimate the actual mortality because it's not seen in a way? Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, we know. Uh, from the, uh, the, 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 um, the experimental study where we found this large effect of litter overlaps. Here we have video recordings. So we've, uh, we, we know from this that even with our very focused attention on these animals and daily inspection, uh, when you compare the video recordings with the daily expect, in, inspections, we found that there is a certain a uh, small percentage of mortality that we miss e even with with uh, uh, the, the the detailed attention and the resources of a, of a research project now that level of mortality is, is that's exclusively on the level of individual pups um, that's definitely something that is going to be missed in an animal facility also because um, technicians may not actually there is no need if there is no need of of uh determining exactly how many mice how many pups were born uh, your main interest is how many you're going to wean so there is not really an incentive for being very exact in counting uh the counting pups and many leave the the cage they just check that a, the, a litter was born but they will only count the pups uh, on the first cage cleaning day and sometimes, especially if technicians are not so into this, or if they have a, a, a lot, uh, they have a huge work pressure, which often they have, they may even, if a litter is born and it's lost immediately, and it's that they're all eaten, the whole litter is sometimes uh, not even registered. That's more rare, but it, it also happens. So there is clearly an underestimate of uh, mortality in these uh, big data, definitely. Thanks. And another question from Irene. Is the perception of the researchers of the problem may be a limitation in addressing this issue? Up to 50% mortality would indeed be unacceptable in farm animals. Is this maybe less in mice because of the perceived lower value of pups as there are many and frequently? Um, that, is, that is not my ex experience in speaking to people. <clears throat> <coughs> in fact, researchers are often very troubled by this, perhaps not so much. <coughs> they are very practically troubled by this because that means that uh, they keep all this, they, they keep this whole breeding colony and they don't get a lot of experimental animals out of it. So they may often actually see this as a, as a big problem, but they don't really know uh, how to address it in any other way than asking the veterinarian or the technicians for uh for help in, in in solving it so here we need to go get through to to these both to the researcher but also to the to the vets and technicians who are the the uh the people who give answers and, and give advice to to researchers in terms of of enhancing survival Thanks. And, no, um, I, I guess, yeah, in yeah. economic terms, there is probably not eventually, possibly not less of an, of an incentive, uh, but it, it is definitely perceived as a problem by, by researchers. Sure. And Yanya uh, is asking, uh, are females of similar age also, could it happen that from lab where more pups died, uh, so maybe due to more older females or animals kept in trails, etc., they produce different individuals that could result in different treatment effects in biomedical research than a lab where less pups die. And could this contribute to the reproducibility fallacy? Um, yeah. Possibly. I mean, no one has looked at that, and it's it's plausible that, that there. It's not a question that I've asked myself, so I'm not familiar with the, with the literature uh, which could uh, provide an, an answer. But we know that the early environment 
have an effect. We know that manipulating man maternal care has a huge effect on uh, the stress anxiety profile of, of uh, uh, both rats and, and mice. So we, it is perfectly plausible, yes. We, I think we currently don't have any more question coming up. If anyone is still typing, you can raise your hand and let me know. Otherwise, I, I want to, yeah, just uh, thank you. We, we, we also approaching the, uh, the, the time now. And I, I just want to thank Anna again. Thank you so much for bringing this very interesting and important topic. And then, yes, hopefully we will have more research, you know, to let us know more about, yeah. Oh, sorry, another question from Irene. So did you try, uh, so she said that sounds like a very good topic for interdisciplinary work. Did you try recording pup births and deaths with an infrared thermal camera? Sorry, can you repeat the last part of the question? If, if we tried to record? Uh, the, the, the birth and the death of the pups with an infrared thermal camera. Yeah, uh, no, we, we, we <clears throat> have not done that. The big problem with using uh, thermal recording here is <clears throat> that you would then have to remove uh, nesting material, which is something that you could do, but you're creating an, a, an extreme situation uh, which you would have uh, some discussions with an animal ethics committee, I think, about, about doing. And we have been criticized for our first study where we used no nesting materials. So we're a bit hesitant to go, to that, go down that, that route. Thanks. And any more questions? Uh, but yeah, but anyway, I was saying, yeah, thank you, Anna, very much for, for your talk today. So yeah, we will, so we, we usually have the webinar every two weeks, but then uh, we will have a break uh, in, in two weeks' time. So we don't have any webinar on the 3rd of August because that week we will have the ISA Global Virtual Meeting and then uh, many of us are involved in organizing that. So yeah, of course I welcome everyone here to also join in. It's free to register and there are many different sessions on different regions. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah maybe we'll have also other uh, talks about laboratory animals as well. So yeah, thank you very much and thanks everyone for joining us uh, today. So I will probably see you guys again in a month's time. And thanks, Anna. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.